They say that, uh, that close, you know, coming close, it only counts in uh, horseshoes and uh, hand grenades. That's the only, only time when being close really you know, amounts to anything. When you really think about it, there's nothing more painful than coming close to winning or coming close to a goal and, and missing it. You know, athletes uh, who are on the losing end of a world championship, for example, uh, after the game is over and the, you know, the losing team, they put on a brave front, you know, and you, they interview the guys and they say, well, it's a game, you know, it'll always be next year. After all, I'm making $20 million a year. Who, what, what, you know, what job is there where you get paid 20 million bucks to be on the losing team? You know, and they, they, they put on a good front, you know, but you know that on the inside, I mean, if they're pro athletes especially, their hearts are melted. Uh, and in private, many of them weep with the bitter thought of having come you know, one point, a whole season, you know, 100 or 125 games or whatever they play for a whole season and lose the championship like, like by a single point, or they lose at the last moment or at the last second. You know. They were just that close to greatness. You know, the Bible has its share of heroes and heroines also. Those who showed great courage and great great faith. And it also provides us with examples of people who only came close to greatness. My, my point about athletes is linked to this idea here. You know, those people in the Bible who were only a heartbeat away from being forever praised, but they didn't quite, they didn't quite make it. You know, we have those stories in the Bible as well. So tonight I'd like to share, usually we talk about the heroes, right? The heroines of faith and, and, and we draw lessons from their lives you know, to encourage us. Tonight I want to talk about the people who came in second. I want to talk about the people who came close to greatness but they, they didn't quite make it and see you know, what, lessons, um, what lessons are there in, the, in their lives? Uh, what can they teach us uh, today? So a couple of characters come to mind. The first one that comes to mind is Cain. You know Cain and Abel? Cain, Genesis chapter four. Cain's story is a familiar one. I'm not going to read it in the, in, the, in the text. I think everyone here knows it. He was the first born to Adam and Eve. He chose to work the land like his father Adam. And from this land he offered a sacrifice to the Lord which was rejected because of its content and the condition of his heart. And he became jealous of his brother's sacrifice, which was accepted, and this jealous rage led him eventually to kill his brother Abel, to murder him. And after this, he left to be a wanderer and, and he was responsible for the establishment of, of cities, if you wish. And we know Cain's story, but do we ever realize what he could have been and what greatness escaped his grasp? Think about it. He was the firstborn and thus could have inherited the dominion and the rulership responsibility of his father uh, Adam. More importantly, he could have been the one through whom the Messiah would have come. But that privilege went to his younger brother Seth. Greatness eluded him because he could not deal with his emotions. He couldn't control his temper. He would not repent of his envy and his jealousy. And because of that, he was so close and yet so far from greatness. Another individual that teaches somewhat the same kind of lessons, Rehoboam. Rehoboam, maybe not as familiar a name in 1 Kings chapter 12. His father Solomon reigned for 40 years and during that time Solomon amassed a fortune as well as the respect from all the neighboring countries. He was at peace with all the neighboring countries. Not only that, but many of them paid tribute and sent him gifts because of his wisdom and the things that he did. And Solomon built a magnificent temple and during his reign the people enjoyed peace and prosperity. It was truly the golden period of, uh, of Israel's, uh, uh, Israel's nationhood. At his death, when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam ascended to the throne. 
and Rehoboam had a marvelous opportunity. He could consolidate Solomon's political gains. Uh, he could spread the light of the Jewish religion to other nations who were primed to listen. They were ready to listen because they had great respect for his father. He had the opportunity to gain the love and the loyalty of the people for his entire lifetime by treating them fairly and honestly. That, that was what was in reach for Rehoboam. Well, soon after his crowning, a delegation of people came to Rehoboam to request a, a, a well-deserved break from a heavy taxation. And his senior advisors told him that if he did this, if he would give the people a break in taxes, he would win over the people and he would gain their support, he would have their loyalty for life. Now, Rehoboam also had younger advisors and friends and they convinced him to treat the people with contempt and not listen to their demands. You know, the idea is don't let the people tell you what to do, you're the king, you tell them what to do. Well, he chose to go with the younger men's advice and he threatened the people in order to keep them in line. This caused a revolt which led to civil war which ultimately divided his kingdom into two. The net result was that Rehoboam was left with about 15% of his territory and his wealth. He now had a constant enemy to the north. This division weakened the Jews in face of other nations. Before they were united, they had power, they had strength. Now they were a divided nation. They were vulnerable now in a way that they hadn't been before. And ultimately the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom fell into idolatry and both were destroyed. In the very end, only the southern kingdom remained and only a fraction of what it was at the separation. Rehoboam could have corrected the mistakes of his father and been a great king in the eyes of man and in the eyes of God, but instead he goes down in history as the one who caused the separation and the ultimate destruction of the Jewish nation. Very close, so close, and yet what happened? He destroyed the opportunity that was, that was right there in his hand. Another uh, example of this, this time we'll read this story. I want you to go to uh, Mark chapter 10. We're going to read. Mark chapter 10, and that's the story of the rich young ruler. Beginning in verse 17, <clears throat> Mark writes, as he was setting out on a journey, a man came up to him, meaning him, meaning Jesus, a man came up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. In this story, Mark reveals a man who truly, I mean truly had potential for greatness. He was young and he was wealthy in a society that saw this as a blessing or a favor from God. He was a sincere believer who acted upon his beliefs. Not just, he didn't just hear the word, but he really tried to do it. And most importantly, he found Jesus and he came personally to the Lord for teaching. Imagine, not just the word, not just one of the apostles or hearsay from one of the disciples, he found the source and went and asked his question. How many times have you ever said to yourself, boy, I wish Jesus was right there in front of me. I've got this nagging problem, I've got this issue, I've got this you know, thing, and, and I, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord was right there and I could just ask Him and He could tell me the answer? Well, this is, what the, this is the opportunity that this guy had. Right there, the Lord's right in front of him. And he could have been great, really great. He could have been a disciple of Jesus and consequently a leader in the church. 
He could have received gifts from the Holy Spirit and he could have done miracles like Philip and the others. He could be with Jesus today in heaven as one of the early martyrs. His name could have been in the scriptures as one of Jesus' not only loved, but Jesus, one which Jesus sent to do His work. All of this was right there in front of Him, within His grasp. This is how close He was. He was speaking face to face with the Son of God. But He failed. He failed. He was so close to immortality and joy, but when Jesus asked him to trade his earthly treasure for heavenly treasure, he couldn't do it. Or maybe he wouldn't do it. The Bible says he went away sad. Perhaps he sensed how close he had come to greatness. I want to tell you about the character of the near great because we've heard many, many, many lessons about those who are great. Let me tell you about the character of the near great. The men that I've talked about lived thousands of years apart and yet had common characteristics that denied them the greatness that was so close at hand. For example, all of them did not recognize their opportunity. They didn't know what they had. In the case of Cain and the rich young ruler, these men were dealing with God face to face, yet they were unaware of the majesty before them and the opportunity that was being presented. Rehoboam had the chance to be greater than his father, who had been the greatest up to that time, but he saw only the threat to his position and not the opportunity that was presented. These men's vision was clouded so that when their moment came, they couldn't recognize it. You know that old saying, happy is the man who is ready when his time comes? These men, their time came, they weren't ready. Another thing they had in common, they aspired to the wrong kind of greatness. It's not that these men did not want to be great or did not want to achieve, they simply were shooting for the wrong goal. Again, Cain, he wanted to dominate his brother instead of pleasing God. Winning over his brother gave him one position, but pleasing God would have given him a primary position in history. Yeah, he won over his brother, he didn't have to deal with his brother anymore, but look at what he lost. And Rehoboam wanted the people to fear him as king instead of loving and respecting him as a benevolent ruler. A small portion eventually feared him, but the rest abandoned him. And instead of building upon the legend of his father, he remained a legendary failure. That's the legend he left behind. And then the rich young ruler, so poignant, what a story. He wanted his good life on earth to remain forever instead of finding a new and better life in heaven. Keeping his temporary riches caused him to forfeit his eternal riches. Each gained something in one way or another, but it cost them the greatness that they, that they could have had. And then another similarity, each one defeated themselves. You ever hear the story, you know, hey, this, this, this game is yours to lose. You know, you go into the third period of a hockey game, you're ahead five to nothing, the game is yours to lose. You know, if, you, if you play sloppy, if you forget defense, if you have a momentary lapse of concentration, you know, those five goals will get erased. You know, you've given the other team the victory. These guys here, they, def they defeated themselves. A you know, management expert gave a speech at a meeting that I attended uh, a while back and he spoke about human development and human motivation and he said that we are 100% responsible for what happens to us. Whoa, 100%? This is how he explained, because I said 100%, I question that. So he, he gave this example, he said, let's say you're hit by a car coming from behind you at a stop sign. You've stopped, you've obeyed the law, you know, your lights work in the back, you stopped at a stop sign, boom, somebody hits you in the back. Now the accident is the other person's fault, yes, but 
we are responsible in a sense because we chose to drive on that day and we chose that route. That was his point. In the end, we make decisions that bring about the things that happen to us. His point was that our big problem is that we try to blame circumstances or other people for our problems, but rarely see that we have usually done or made the decisions to bring us to where we are. How many times, as a preacher, how many times have I done counseling with people and they'll come to my office and they'll talk and I'll hear them talk and I'll hear them say and I'll hear them tell me all the decisions that they made and so on and so forth, but at the end the mess that they're in is always somebody else's fault. You know, my, my father didn't pay attention to me. My mother didn't, you know, she, wasn't, she was a working mom. You know, you know, my boss wasn't fair. My wife doesn't understand me. Or, you know, I, I have a weakness for drugs, you know, or whatever. It's everybody else's fault except them. And the hard job there in counseling is to carefully maneuver this person in front of a mirror to help them take a good long look at the one who's responsible for where they're at. At least accept the portion of responsibility that belongs to them. At least that part. So these men that I was talking about, they were responsible for destroying their chance at greatness. Cain refused to deal with his anger and he let it boil over into resentment and ultimately a murderous rage. He refused God's warning and ruined his brother's life as well as his own. Whose fault was it? It was his fault. He had God telling him, look, sin is at the door, you need to master it, you're in trouble. Imagine if God himself is saying to you, look, you're in trouble here, you're on the edge, you need to be careful. And Rehoboam chose to listen to the advice of those who told him what he wanted to hear instead of the advice of wisdom. His own foolishness led him to destroy his own throne and divide the nation. And the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler refused to give up the comfort of this world for the promise of the next world. You know, I go back to my opening statements about worshiping God, the songs we sing, you know, we get into it, and we've sung these songs before and somehow it becomes mundane, it becomes repetitious sometimes and we forget that we're singing to Almighty God. But the reason that we're singing these spiritual songs, the reason that we're lifting up our voices, the reason that we're saying these kinds of words that don't appear in any other context other than our songs here, because you listen to the radio and you listen to the TV and you listen to you know, the, the hits on record and so on and so forth, listen to those words, right? What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about relationships between people, I love you, I don't love you, you know, that's 80% of the songs. Our songs talk about a kingdom that we can't see, a place that's in the future, a promise that's been given to us by God, that's what our songs our songs are about a place that we hope to go to. Amen. Our worship, our time together, is about encouraging one another to hold fast to the promise that God has given us. We hold fast to a kingdom we cannot see. We obey a Lord we cannot touch. That's, that's the meaning and the beauty of our, of our songs. The rich young ruler refused to give up the comfort of this world for that promise of the next. His choice led him away from the company of Jesus, not only in this world, but in the eternal world to come as well. Imagine these three, and we, we could name more, but these three are a good example. They, they, they came so close to true greatness, not just the temporary applause of fame or fortune on this earth, but the true greatness that goes on forever. And they sabotaged their place in history by the choices that they made. They made those choices. And because of this, they and others like them, I mean, could we list others? How about Lot's wife? She almost escaped. And Esau, who sold his heritage for a meal. 
and Saul the king who forfeited his crown because of a simple disobedience, because of impatience, and Demas who left the company of Paul. All of these came close to a greatness they did not achieve on earth and will never see in heaven. Now do you realize that each of us is just a heartbeat away from greatness? I'm not talking about winning a gold medal at the Olympics or being president or anything like this. These things are great, but they're, they're temporary. I'm talking about the greatest honor that exists in all of creation, in all of history. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, Paul describes it. He says very simply, if we died with Him, meaning Jesus, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. To reign, to reign like a king, like a queen. The death that Paul refers to here is our death with Jesus in the waters of baptism, of course, Romans chapter 6, verse 3. And the position or the honor he talks about is to be at the right hand of God in heaven. The right hand of God meaning the, 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 the position of power and authority. Essentially what he's saying is this, Christians who remain faithful until the end will reign with Christ at the right hand of God forever. We understand the individual words, don't we? But we cannot conceive of what that feels like. That's what I mean about holding on to a promise about a place we can't see. Paul is describing it here. There's no higher honor. There's no greater privilege. There is no greatness one can aspire to that is greater than this to be part of the Godhead and rule over the spiritual world, which may be more vast and varied than the physical world. Certainly it is more glorious. This is the greatest. And each one of you, each one of you and each that we come in contact with can achieve this goal. We are so close to it. So my question this evening is very simple. Which ones here tonight will be great? And which ones will merely come close to being great? The reasons for making it or coming close are the same as they have always been. Those who will become great are those who have obeyed God and maintained that obedience. It begins, of course, by confessing Christ and being baptized, repenting of our sins, the beginning of our obedience. And those who remain faithful until the end. Remember last time I spoke about holding on, holding on to the promise, the things that we do here, the singing, the praying, the service, the worship, the study, all of that are simply spiritual exercises that enable us to just hold fast to that promise. We have it, those of us who have responded to God in repentance and baptism, in faithful living, we have it, we've got it. And, and, and what we do here, what the leaders encourage us to do is hold on to that greatness that we have in our hands until it's fully realized when Jesus comes. So there are those here tonight, most I would imagine, who have already obtained that greatness. The question is to hold on. Remember what we said? The game is yours to lose. This greatness is yours to lose. You have it. You have it. But then there are those who will only come close. Those who refuse to obey. Those who put off obeying. Those who let go of what they already have because they want to go back to the world for whatever reason those who put off obeying Christ until it's too late, or they fall away before He comes. There are those among us you know, who are close, but they're not quite there yet. And I think when we look at our own hearts, we know who they are. We know who we are. We know which group we're in. Are we the ones that are holding on to the greatness we have, or are we the ones that are just close, but not quite there yet? So I encourage you, let's, let's not spend an eternity in regret because you were so close 
but did not close the gap in time. I encourage you as we do each Lord's Day and each time someone is in this pulpit, we encourage you, please be great, obey the gospel, be restored, start being faithful, confess your sins, begin to serve, be great today. And if you have that greatness, by all means, please, please hold on to that greatness until He comes.